two minutes. One of the things that we can do as, um, as a group is uh, if some of you have responses for each other to the work that's being done, and then we can go to some of the, the questions that we have. Well, Jeff, if I can, I have to sure. go to, I have to get off here in just a minute uh, for something else. But it seems to me when you listen to kind of what all was said, I mean, it's we've learned some things, but we've also learned some things that many people thought, you know, weren't true that, it, you know, they always say the most dangerous things are those that think items that people think are true, but aren't true. I mean, first we learned governments can manage migration. Governments can shut borders. I mean, 2020 is going to go down as a year of immobility, not a year of mobility. And, you know, it's easy to think that we're going to build back better and everything's going to go back and we're going to cooperate at the UN. I'm not so sure that that's the way it's all going to go. So I do think that one thing we should take away from this is that that there there this break. I mean, at least I never predicted COVID. I'm not sure anybody did, but there were a whole lot of people who were writing stories about governments can't manage migration, uh, transnationalism is here to stay, mig you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we've learned that maybe that's not quite right. I mean, maybe it was. Uh, it's just something to sort of think about, and I think that we really learned that there's not near as much inter international cooperation on migration as what we might have hoped. I think of all those people stranded on ships. We couldn't even figure out how to get crew people on ships, off those ships or into countries, not to stay and risk COVID, but just get them home. In some cases, their home countries wouldn't take them back. In some cases, the countries where their ships were docked wouldn't let them off. So we had people that normally would have had eight or nine month contracts on ships for much, much longer. If their contracts ended in April and they couldn't move, uh, some of them are still there. Uh, and uh, I, I think the whole shipping industry, which are migrant workers kind of by definition, showed not cooperation, but lack of cooperation even for something that I think almost all people could agree were people trapped through no fault of their own uh, in something. So I, I do hope it's good to be an optimist, uh, but I, I do think, and I, I am basically optimistic, but I, I think that the one thing to kind of watch for and where this book hopefully will set a standard that other people can look at is, I think it'll be, I think the 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 mistake that some people will make is to assume things are going to go back to the way they were. I'm not so sure that that's correct. But the hard thing, of course, is to say in what new directions will things go? I mean, we just heard in the case of India now, there is a huge awareness of gaps between rural and urban. In Mexico, there's been a big awareness of just how poor the southeastern states are and how differently they're governed. A lot of, South, in, as, as Jeff knows, uh, in a lot of the villages in southern Mexico, they simply closed all outsiders, including residents, in order to keep COVID from coming in because they have very limited health care facilities. Well, that trapped migrants who tend to leave, uh, internal migrants who tend to leave, that, uh, either they had to rush back before the village closed or they had to stay away and not know when they're going to go back home. So, so I think, you know, some things were highlighted by COVID, but I think the hard thing is going to be to see around the corner and see where things go next. But I want to thank the co-authors and Jeff and Ibrahim. Uh, I can stay on a few more minutes and then I have to uh, jump off. Thank you very much. Jeff. That was super. Uh, um, do you guys have, are there other comments you'd like me? Go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, just a little, little rebuttal, and I, I feel a little nervous to, to contradict um, Phil Martin, from whom I have learned so much over the years. I'm actually 17 years ago, mostly to the day that I met Phil in Geneva when we were both at the ILO, um, working on um, multilateralism and, and the UN. Um, but I think 
what makes me so so I think first managing migration we don't see managing migration closing the borders the ability of closing the borders for me is not a sign of managing migration right so I think managing migration and governing migration is and that's my peeve and pet topic so I'm happy to to discuss that more is much much more and the simplistic idea of closing borders which you see unfortunately I do believe and I maybe some bias of me I don't or my, or my ignorance I don't think we'll see that very easily in the future that was a, definitely a very strange thing that borders were closed that much and it came at a, at a huge cost like economic cost for like tourism and L. So I think countries will remain very hesitant to repeat that. And beyond that, I think it has shown, and we were, we were publishing a blog post with Nomad, um, with, the, with the World Bank, um, UNDP, um, and the OEC Development Center that comes out about in an hour or so, um, on how we actually have learned that not integrating migrants and displaced persons, including irregular migrants or internal migrants of India and other cases, um, into healthcare plans, into economic plans, etc., can have huge detrimental impacts, right? No one is safe until everybody is safe. So I think we have seen like if we if we take politics aside just from the policy, from the rational point of view, we have a huge um, um, argument for in integrating mobility much better in all the different policy sectors. And if that will take place or not, of course, will also depend on political factors. But I'm, for that reason, I remain more optimistic because it has shown to everybody that we cannot ignore migration. And it's not just about closing borders, but it, but understanding the linkages to agriculture, to um, financial services, to um, employment, to social protection, to healthcare, to all these other act act um, um, sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We have a question um, that is um, really directed, I think, at uh, Sadana and uh, her work in South Africa. And it asks, what role do formal and informal social protections play as coping mechanisms in the wake of the pandemic, exclusions, and overall vulnerability among immigrant groups in South Africa? So we'll let her respond. Thanks, uh, Jeff. So South Africa has a constitution which is underpinned by human rights. And unfortunately, what happens at grassroots level is, is at odds with the constitution and human rights. What I've mentioned in my chapter is the role of civil society organizations in actually holding government accountable and how important this is for a stable democracy and I've given examples such as, for example, the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. I've spoken about the Center for Applied Legal Studies and how both of these have actually articulated critical messages to government during lockdown by commending the South African government for ensuring, for example, non-national sponsor shop owners are not discriminated against when initially they were. They've also suggested that government strengthens regulations and undertakes practical measures to protect persons in order to ensure that their businesses are not affected by the actions that amount to xenophobia. Of course, I've referred to this as our particular flavor called Afrophobia. And this, of course, is, is also government to alert government, please tread carefully post the pandemic. And the second um, imagination that I offer, the post-pandemic imagination that I offer, relates to this, where what we've been seeing right now, and, and I mentioned this when I spoke about Daniel and why I'm not particularly positive about what's going on in South Africa at the moment, because we do have, for example, an organization called the African Transformation Movement, and that has presented a post-COVID-19 economic recovery plan and if that's adopted, it will actually see South Africans claiming back all sectors that are perceived to be unfairly dominated by foreigners. And that's definitely going to extend to immigrant owned um, spaza shop owners. And uh, this has now become a thorn to government and native spaza shop owners over the years. There's also a, a plan titled Put South Africa First that has been submitted to government. And it looks at other African countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Ghana, 
which has already set the bar high with legislation to exclude immigrants from certain sectors of the economy. So again, I think that we need to look back at the AU Agenda 2063 and um, whose impl which implementation will again start to disappear into the horizon if we look at all of these insular goals that countries are now adopting. I hope I've, I've answered that question sufficiently. Thank you, Simona. I think, I think you did. That was very interesting. Um, this is, of course, a huge issue, not just for South Africa, but I think, uh, as, as Philip and, and Daniel both mentioned, for, for you know, at a global kind of level. Um, does anyone have another comment to perhaps add, or if you are wrong? Okay, so I'm going to use my Zoom skill to figure that we'll move on. <laughs> And uh, we'll move to another question. This one is for Ram. Uh, do you think Indian government, the Indian government will face more challenges to minimize the gap created by the rural urban, created by rural in, urban migration in the future within the nation? Yes, uh, uh, the policies that were followed uh, during the last uh, uh, 30 years since the liberalization of India, uh, that is the dividing point 1991. Now, during the last few years, this has accelerated. So we have uh, a smart city mission. So big cities are getting more attention. But then again, uh, urban inclusion has not been priority. But what this COVID has brought, there are few uh, programs and policy changes uh, are visible and which the government has committed. And one is about the rental housing for the migrant worker. This is a very good change, rental housing for the mi migrant worker, the government has announced. So what uh, you are saying is correct, that uh, go government policy has widened rural-urban divide and uh, rural area has been thought of only of agriculture. And uh, we have 45% population of India dependent on agriculture, just 15% uh, uh, of the GDP contributing to, to the nation. So there is a massive workforce. So what we are realizing, our government is not able to realize, or many policy makers are not uh, giving attention to the fact that agriculture alone, agricultural development alone, cannot uplift rural area. Rural area uh, wants non-farm jobs. And non-farm jobs can be through some sort of uh, peri-urbanization or urbanization. So uh, we, we don't need more urban development, but we need more urbanization, uh, which can urbanize rural area and create non-farm jobs. Uh, so that is, I think, challenge and uh, policy. There, are, there is no radical change in terms of thinking on this direction. Uh, and thinking is mainly concentrated that ag increase agricultural production, income of the rural area will increase. I think that is not correct. Uh, the correct thing will be uh, how to uh, industrialize rural industrialization urbanization and creating non-farm jobs based on local resources and local industries. I think that is major challenge I think India has to learn in future uh, to bridge urban rural divide and to reduce the type of circular and temporary migration. Circular and temporary migrants are basically the badly hit and it is around uh, close to 20 million people, maybe more. As I told you, we don't have uh, exact data but we estimate, or this is a guess estimate, something like 20 million people circulated. They don't have a foothold in urban area. They are not included as a part. And as they are not included in the part of the urban, they are politically, so they have voting right, but they cannot vote at the time of election because voting is concerned to the constituency, concerned from where they come. 
So these are some of the things going on, portability of voting rights. So it is not simply rural urban divide, that is one thing. Related with that, we have massive political exclusion and social exclusion, and that is what uh, we need to uh, have a holistic policy uh, on, on development and, uh, uh, and social, uh, uh, social equity. So that is what my answer will be in short. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, any comments uh, that anyone would like to add? Well, uh, another question then, and this one um, is really directed at Melissa, asking about remittances, and it and it's there are two parts to that, to this. Um, the first is is to wonder if the pattern that we're finding coming out of COVID, and as you as you point out, there's an expectation of decline in remittance practices. If this will lead to and maybe an increase in um, informal sorts of exchanges uh, taking place, um, and then uh, the second part of that question then would be what kinds of checks and balances might arise around those informal processes, those informal transfers? Sure, so um, as far as informal uh, remittances are concerned, actually what we've seen through the pandemic is that a lot of the ways that money is transferred informally has really been hampered. So the most common way of informally transferring remittances is through hand carrying. And that is either by sending the money with a friend, um, someone else that you know that's going back home or, or even, you know, train conductors or things like that. And with the closure of borders and the and many of the lockdowns, just mobility in general has been extremely hampered. So actually we've seen almost less informal remittances um, in many regards. Of course, there are other types of informal remittances too that are often used things like um, Hawala kind of, of, of services and those have been hampered to some extent, maybe not as much as things that actually as transfers that actually need to physically move across borders. Um, so I actually don't think that um, the current COVID situation has allowed for more informal transfers. If anything, it has actually affected those even more. And what we've seen also is that um, there's there's been more and more of a reliance really on um, electronic money or being able to move money electronically. But I mean, but what we see there is that, of course, people who are unbanked, people who are not as uh, financially literate and definitely not as electronically literate are then having more difficulties, right? So if, if you know, if you have bank accounts in different countries, if you know how to move money around electronically, if you even know how to use Western Union electronically and you're not worried and you don't need to go to an actual operator, all of that was still open to you during the pandemic but people need to have additional skills for that to be able to happen. So we're really seeing, I guess, an increase in inequality in that regard as to who has access to these more electronic forms of payment and those who don't and those who know how to use them and those who don't. And I think that's really the divide that we've been seeing now during during the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, we're still trying to figure out if we can get uh, our other presenters um, linked in to speak so that we can actually hear them. Uh, so what I'd like to ask everyone to do as we're um, as kind of struggling with uh, technology so much fun, um, is ask our, our panelists um, to maybe uh, add a comment uh, given the discussion that we've had, uh, given the other papers that we've listened to, the other presentations that we've listened to, uh, comments that they might like to um, share, maybe pointing towards where we might go uh, with this. Melissa, can you add? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so something because I was trying to keep it short before that I didn't really get to get to, which maybe I can say a little bit more about is um, really the compound effects of the lack of remittances that we're going to see now. So one thing is that 
you know, a lot of the um, the countries that are, you know, most reliant on these th on these types of influx are going to be losing two sources of income at the same time. So they're going to lose a source of tax revenue when they need it the most. So not may, not necessarily even just income tax, but sales tax, things like that. So you're going to see a kind of compounding effect. Um, also, banks in migrant source countries often rely on remittance inflows as a cheap source of deposit funding. And what we're seeing now is that with the lack of money coming in, this also doesn't allow for the banking sector, for the financial sector to be as vibrant as it should be or that we would like to be. So um, these banks are now, for instance, likely to see their costs of operations increase, their ability to extend credit decrease, um, whether to the private sector or to finance government deficits. So all of this is likely to be greatly reduced too. So this is where we start to see the compounding effects of this reduction in remittances. So typically, for instance, the credit constrained private sector, which is mostly comprising of self-employed people and small and medium sized enterprises are also likely to re re lose remittance funding. Um, and in addition to dealing with even higher and tighter credit conditions from banks. So remittances are often used as a source of external financing that are used kind of in the place of loans or loans from financial institutions. And here now, a lot of these small, small medium sized enterprises are going to kind of be hit doubly. So not having that source of financing, but then also it becoming more difficult to get formal financing from banks and financial institutions. Um, we also see some other compounding effects like um, a pro prolonged crisis in some of some rich countries that migrants are generally going to and uh, um, those people who are then uh, based in those countries are going to be out of work for longer and probably also lose their residency status if they had it. You also have examples of the oil rich Gulf states, for instance, um, and the UAE where the drop in oil prices that has happened now also during the COVID pandemic is really going to affect their economy and their ability to also employ the massive numbers of migrants that those economies often employ. So in many of those countries, up to, you know, 80 or 70, 80 percent of the population and definitely the labor market is made up of, of foreign workers. And if those countries now are seeing a reduction in their economic capability, we're probably also going to see a reduction in the numbers of migrants that they're going to be bringing in and those that they're um, able to also give work. So you can just see that the the COVID pandemic is having kind of several knock on effects that are also going to increase um, more pressures in many of these countries. So I'm sorry that that sounds like a really bleak picture, but I think it's important for us to understand what's going on. And that means that many governments need to step up to the plate. Now we need to see more social protection kicking in, even though that might be difficult for some governments. We are already seeing that some um, governments in, let's say, richer countries that host migrants, such as uh, um, Ireland, that are extending social protection to immigrants and also to even irregular immigrants. So this is going to be really important now in these periods, especially when we're getting more ex extended lockdowns, when um, people are not able to um, earn a living at the moment that the countries where migrants currently are need to also step up with more social protection programs as well as the countries where migrants are coming from, where we're not going to see the same amount of remittances that we have been seeing. So I think there's a really important policy component there. Thank you, Melissa. That, that was so important. And it actually brings up uh, a really important point that I, I believe Manet and Hassan were going to speak to, which is, are these issues of protection. Um, I don't know if we're able to get the technology to work. Is there any possibility that can zoom in? Or are we still kind of I would I would just add, you know, one of the uh, one of the challenges I see coming out of this are the uh, mental health costs of what Melissa is talking about. And one of the things that um, has been interesting working in uh, in southern Mexico is that remittances have not declined, uh, but one of the challenges is whether 
um, mental health is uh, really suffering because of that. There's a, the added pressure of, of the moon. So there's a lot of interesting. So here's a question that I think everyone on the panel can uh, respond to. Uh, what do you think about the cooperation of international organizations such as ILO and IOM to govern migration during and after the COVID crisis? What consequences might be in sight for migrants? Anybody like to respond? I don't see the question. I also don't see it. Oh, OK. Uh, well, here, I, I'll just I'll, I will read it again. Um, what do you think of cooperation in international organizations such as the ILO and IOM to govern migration during and after the crisis? What consequences may come in sight for migrants? I mean, that that's if I may go first. Um, is part of um, my chapter and, and, and things that I work on, um, which is about interagency cooperation. So how do the, the IOM, um, the ILO, but also UNDP, um, the World Bank, and um, UNHCR and, and, and others um, um, work more closely together? And um, I think we have seen that in the past, I mean, there's always been some rivalries between UN agencies, which is like we often call about the UN family, but in, like in many families, there are some dysfunctional elements, right? Um, um, and um, so the UN, there, there's, there's sometimes competition for funds, there's a mandate question, there is um, personal ideas about who is representing these agencies with what kind of ideas and, and, and ambitions. And, but and um, overall, we have seen a big push towards more collaboration. Um, and the bigger migration is, is the more we understand that we need, we can't just focus on the labor aspects by itself because labor aspects are connected to health and social protection aspects, to other transnational aspects. Um, so I think this multi-sectoral approach um, that um, the, the development and um, reform has, um, so, uh, some of you who have worked in development know that um, as of last year, the UN development system has a new um, overarching um, framework and um, how the UN works at the country level. And, and that pushes much more towards funding of joint projects where the UN agencies have to come together with the IOM, the UNHCR, the UNDP, UNCDF, UNFPA, all the different agencies come together um, to work on joint projects. So I definitely believe that there is, we will see more of that. It has been there before, and now during the, through the pandemic, we have seen stronger collaborations. And one thing I want to add is, any crisis is an opportunity for change, right? We, often, we heard from, I think Melissa um, mentioned the phrase, and Phil mentioned the phrase, build back better. That's something at the, in the international sphere, we often talk about that. But it's also clear that these windows of opportunity don't automatically lead to better policies. And as um, Sadana and also Phil said, there are lots of bleak ideas and things that may go bad and, and more withdrawal from um, empathy and, 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 and extension of services and rights, etc. So I think it's up to policy entrepreneurs at the, at the global, at the regional, at the national, at the subnational level to actually use this and highlight, I think there are so many reasons that we should really focus on building inclusive societies that include migrants. It also shows that the, we can close the border at a high cost. It's nothing we can redo very easily, but irregular migrants were here nonetheless. These people got COVID regardless of whether we decreed them not to get it. So, um, not including them into health systems. And I guess that's something that also um, 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 Monette and, and Sun would have talked about, um, is a huge risk for our resident population, regardless how you stand on the rights of these mobile populations. So I think, again, us, many of us who work in this area and, and who anyway believe that we need, that's a human rights point, but also a very public policy point of view that Good public policy means an inclusive, a gender responsive policy that is not just because you believe um, in 
um, the rights of women, but because overall it makes a better policy if it's a gender responsive policy, right? So um, these arguments may help many of you on the call maybe and, and others to push um, parliaments and, 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 and entities and, 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 and civil society overall to focus on a good response that includes migrants in a substantive way. So again, I don't, that's why my optimism is there. This crisis has delivered us a lot of the good arguments for pushing in the right direction. If we are successful, depends on a lot of structural and political factors that I cannot predict completely. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, a question again for uh, Sahana. Uh, do you think that there will be a big transformation of the Shapsa's shops to alternative small businesses in South Africa for the future? Oh, how I wish I could be optimistic yet. But unfortunately, history has shown us in South Africa that there's not much optimism in this area. Let me give you an example. So government um, had a, a strategy called Nibis, and so they invested 50 million rand in this particular strategy. However, it was an exclusionary strategy because it kept out immigrant entrepreneurs and it was specific to native owned entrepreneurs. And in fact, government did have the audacity to invite immigrant entrepreneurs to come and share their ideas on how they became so successful in South Africa, yet none of that money from that pot went to them. So it's somewhat unfortunate that the South African government does not realize the enormity of the contribution that coming from immigrant entrepreneurs. So while I would love to actually be able to say, yes, indeed, South Africa needs to make this turn. And, and I've said it in my conclusion, I've said that across the world, the establishment and growth of small businesses by immigrants has been lauded in host countries for immigrant socioeconomic contributions, for job creation, filling gaps in the market. Of course, immigrant uh, entrepreneurs, they do hire local South Africans, but Democratic South Africa has been one of these few exceptions. And this pandemic has highlighted South Africa's total erosion of its commitment to human rights and an absolute sidestepping of the African Union's trust for regional unity and, and, and cooperation. Of course, I, I hope that it's an opportunity for government to invest in the informal economy, to harness immigrant sponsor shop entrepreneurs and who have been purposefully excluded. But of course, what we've seen thus far is that this is very going to be very, very difficult to achieve, given the kind of political comments that we've been seeing across the pandemic and even before the pandemic as well. Very, very negative comments by politicians about immigrants. So it's almost as if the immigrants have become the scapegoats during COVID. If politicians fail, blame it on the immigrants. They are, they are there, that's what they are there for. Blame everything on the immigrants. And it's really, really sad when they are not acknowledged for the phenomenal work and the contributions they're making to the economy and to, to life in townships. Thank you. Thank you, Sinan, that was uh, really well put. Um, again, I wanna apologize that our some of our panelists were not able to work on that tech to get it to cooperate. And that seems to be part of our the world that we live in now. Um, but as we're uh, getting towards the end of our time, I'd like to ask the panelists who are here, the four folks that are here, to um, maybe for a final comment um, on um, you know, their outlooks, um, maybe hopeful, maybe not. Anyway, just a, a final comment. And Daniel, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Jeff. and. Um, Th thanks for um, my co-panelists. Um, I, I learned a lot. Um, a reminder to those who are um, to watching this, um, the things that we've heard here from, from the panelists is just a, a, a tiny fraction of the entire book, like it's 17 chapters. And for me, um, one of the key takeaway points is 
Like migration is so intertwined with so many different sectors and, and ideas about society, about narratives, about politics, about um, policy, um, about gl the global level. And, and I think it's up to us um, and to everybody to understand the complexities. We often um, think about just immigrants, but immigrants are immigrants at the same time, right? And how different things are interlinked. Um, as I mentioned in my previous comment, how um, migrants' um, legal status, their economic status and situation, their health situation and, and the rated policies, they're all interlinked. And so, we can't just say, oh, we don't want to give certain rights to irregular immigrants or migrants in regular legal status, because that has many repercussions for these people, but also for the host societies and the societies um, where they come from. So I think understanding the complexity and helps us to, to devise better policies and better narratives. And helps us to understand that these the scapegoating that Sanana just just, just mentioned, right, um, is in natural in terms of we see it all the time by some host societies who scapegoat immigrants. But as all of us who do research on migrants and migration and the impact of migration know, it's just plainly wrong, right? And um, there are almost the very, very, very minor negative impacts. Sometimes, of course, there can be one criminal and one migrants. They're just people sometimes, but overall migrant migration does not lower wages. It does not increase criminality. It does not all the things that anti-immigrant groups often claim they do. So I think the short highlights, and again, this is a reminder for those who are interested in reading the book. And what I love about the book is that the chapters are extremely short, which I hated as write as writer because I hate I hate writing short things. But they're all super short, and um, so it's very easy to get a, get an overview of all the different aspects, and then try to combine them and use them as a leverage to build political arguments. In the end, we need political arguments to to build better better solutions that benefit again migrants as well as the societies in which they live and the societies where they come from. So um, I continue learning. I, I continue engaging with um, the, the audience and people who, who, who bring us good questions and, and further ideas, but also from the co-panelists with whom I um, um, from whom I learn a lot. Thanks again, um, Jeff and Ibrahim, for this great book project and I look forward to more collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Melissa, we have about just a little bit over five minutes, so just a, a quick final comment for us. Yeah, I think really just final comment following up uh, what Daniel just said that, you know, everything is is so interlinked. And I think the importance here is that um, we need, you know, responsive, responsible governments, both in countries of origin and countries of destination to try to make sure that the the negative effects that we do see from this pandemic can be mitigated as much as possible. And we do have a lot, a lot of opportunities here. So, you know, build back better is something that's come up a lot. And I think that is a huge opportunity all over the world for us to learn from our mistakes of the past and do things better and the way they should be done in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Ron. Yeah, thank you. It was a great learning uh, experience uh, and many things I knew. Uh, I still emphasize that uh, we should uh, focus a little more on internal migration. Uh, in India also, we have a lot of emphasis on immigrants and diaspora uh, because of remittances. Huge, uh, India is the largest country, uh, is, is the largest recipient of remittances. Uh, so I think uh, this uh, internal migration should get focus and uh, more focus and how to integrate internal migration with uh, development and social inclusion. Uh, when it comes to the migration or policy for migrants, uh, for the internal migrants, we find that our experiences and learning of international migration is uh, coming, uh, is guiding us. But sometimes it is a barrier. Uh, a barrier also. International migration comes with a lot of governance issues. Uh, whereas uh, internal migration is closely related with uh, development issue, and uh, internal migration cannot be looked in a atomist, atomistic way in isolation as we are looking international migration, because internal migration is closely related with process of urbanization. 
and process of urbanization we don't talk about in respect with international migration so what is happening to my mind is some of the things which we are learning in terms of methods approaches and our knowledge of international migration in fact becomes a barrier in understanding international internal migration so i think this is what uh, we need to uh, have focus as academics here and then one more thing i like to say about india that uh, india when people talk about migration policy uh, so i as a under whatever understanding myself have of the indian constitution and india situation uh, for working during the last uh, 30 years so uh, i argue that india does not need a migration policy because constitution guarantees indian constitution guarantees right to move is a fun, fundamental right under article 19 of the constitution so moving within india is a fundamental right then what what is the policy there should be policy for the migrants we need to make a, a distinction methodologically migration and migrants we migration is something part of mobility part of our human desire and aspiration but migrants need something focus so this is what i like to say uh, at the end that we should focus on migra migrants as well as internal migrants thank also you. thank you very much uh sadhana would you like to add something very brief okay so i'm going to i'm just going to add two things here what is it we need and what is it we're going to get okay what we need is inclusivity we need what italy said leave no one behind what uh, nelson mandela said south africa is for all who live in it and that includes immigrants that's what we need that's not what we're going to get unfortunately what we're going to get and let us not forget the critical discourse here we're going to get those who have the power and we've already seen it we've seen it in the vaccines who has purchased all the vaccines before they can even hit the rest of the world it's the uk the usa where's africa in all of this okay it's about the bargaining power who has the bargaining power here and unfortunately immigrants are sitting right at the bottom in all of this thanks very much chef i'm not going to take up any more of your time <laughs> Oh, thank you, Sadana. I think those are very good words for us to end on. Um, I want to thank all of you for contributing. Um, I have to say, putting this together has been an incredible honor. Uh, it's been an incredible honor for me uh, to work with all of you. And it has been so much fun to actually get to meet you in virtual sort of person rather than just through email today. So it's so nice to, to connect. Uh, and I hope that we can continue. For uh, our audience, um, as you'll see here, we have our migration coming, our migration conference coming in London uh, later in 2021 in July. It is honestly having started to go to conferences in the 1980s. These are the best conferences I've ever been to. So um, you've, you've got my uh, recommendation at least. Please join us if you have um, an interest. We would love to have you come with us. Um, and please do check in on our website that goes with our book, COVID-19 and Migration. It will have some uh, brief um, uh, downloadable um, references to the book with some of the authors. Some of today's material uh, should go up on it soon as well. And we encourage you to contact us as you do your work as you add to this discussion, it's only just starting. Uh, I think this has been a wonderful opportunity to see where it can go. These are wonderful voices, important voices, and we encourage all of you to add your voices to them. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to hearing more from all of you in the future. Thanks again. Bye everyone.